Welcome to our late edition of Noontime Prayer and a reading of the Psalms. Uh, I experienced uh, some technical difficulties, couldn't get it live streamed, uh, couldn't even get it recorded. So I finally figured out maybe what was going on in part. And so I'm recording it and going to post it uh, so you can uh, still hear the broadcast from earlier today. Um, we are here to pray. And so let's begin with prayer today. Father, just uh, thank you for today. I thank you that uh, in spite of some technical difficulties, uh, we can still get together and uh, pray together. And Father, I just, um, I know this is troubling times. Uh, the troubles keep piling up. I know yesterday our daughter Nicole got uh, laid off and today she went on uh, Apple Health and I'm thankful for that. But uh, it's just a lot of stress in our life with loss of jobs loss of income, uh, not knowing where we're going to be able to pay our bills, whether there'll be enough food on our tables. Uh, so many things, Lord, to worry about. And yet uh, I'm reminded that you are the good shepherd. You said, I am the good shepherd. Uh, and so I, I give you praise for that. When you actually said, I am the good shepherd, you were claiming, you were saying that you're the good shepherd of Psalm 23. So, Lord, I pray that psalm back to you today. I thank you that you are our shepherd. You're the one who uh, watches over us, that uh, watches our coming and going. You make sure that we're safe. You make sure that we're fed. You make sure that we have plenty to drink. You are our shepherd. We shall not want. Uh, right now it seems like that doesn't make much sense because we might be in want of groceries or finances or uh, so many different things, even a place to live, uh, Lord. But, Father, I just thought, thank you that you are our shepherd, and we shall not want. You make us lie down in green pastures. Here we, you've made us lie down in our own homes. You've given us a rest. Sometimes I think, Lord, that we get so busy with life that we forget uh, just to, to stop and take a rest. And maybe one of the things you're doing is requiring us to take a long, deep holiday, a long, deep rest. Uh, you lead us beside still waters. That was in order that the sheep uh, could have a quiet place to drink where they wouldn't have to worry about falling into the rapids. But Father, I thank you that you lead us beside still waters, a place of peace, a place of well-being, a sense of well-being. And Father, we don't necessarily have that sense of well-being right now. And sometimes your, your peace es escapes us, Lord. But you lead us beside still waters. As a good shepherd, even today, you are leading us beside those places, those still waters in our life, uh, where your peace is restored to us, where that sense of well-being is restored to us. You restore our soul. Lord, I just thank you for that. Uh, our soul, uh, you restore our mind, our will, and our emotions. Uh, that's our soul. And Father, just uh, thank you that. I can get troubled in these days. I can fall into fear when I see some of the posts online or some of the news. I can fall into uh, concern and worry about my daughter who's a nurse who's on the front lines uh, taking temperatures at Mary Bridge and all that sort of thing. Um, and I can fall into kind of a downcast uh, spirit in me. And yet you restore our soul. Uh, you put us back together again. Uh, I thank you for that. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. When we start wandering off that path of the righteousness which comes from God the Father, from which comes from God, not on uh, the basis of our own merit, but on the basis of faith in God, you lead us in those paths of righteousness for Jesus' sake. Uh, I thank you for that, Lord. That you have a path ahead uh, through all this pandemic. That path of righteousness goes straight forward through this pandemic and that you are leading us on that path. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. Um, I've always said that the whole world is living in the valley of the shadow of death. Ever since Adam and Eve, we've all been living there. Uh, death has been uh, our constant curse uh, as a people. And yet now it's become poignant uh, for some of us through illness and through heart disease and cancer and other kinds of diseases. Uh, but now you've plunged, or not you, but 
this uh, pandemic has plunged the whole world into the valley of the shadow of death in a very real way, where uh, many of us are wondering, uh, will I survive this? Um, even though I, we walk through the valley of the sh shadow of death, we fear no evil, for you are with us. That constant companionship, that promise that I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Sake you. So wherever we are in this journey of the shadow of death, we don't have to be afraid because you're the good shepherd who's watching out over us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort, they comfort us. Your, that shepherd's rod was a thick rod that was used for uh, driving away the wolves and the bears and the lions. And the staff has, was that long staff with a crook on it when the stupid sheep would wander away into a thicket or a, a thicket of brambles and gets their uh, thick wool all caught up in the brambles. That staff could be hooked around their body and then pull them out of the brambles, or if they'd fallen over a cliff onto a ledge, the shepherd could reach down with that staff and lift them up. And Father, you right now are watching our life with your rod, keeping the enemies of the uh, fallen angels and Satan and all of his cohorts away from us. And your staff, it protects us from ourselves, Lord. I thank you that even now you are protecting us from ourselves. They, they comfort us, Lord that you, as a good shepherd, are watching over us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Our enemies are those uh, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies, the rulers and powers uh, of the air. Uh, you prepare a table before us in the presence of those enemies. And that table, I can't help but think of that table as being the table of communion now for us, that you have provided your shed blood and your broken body, and that when those enemies come and accuse us in our thoughts or accuse us uh, over our past, that table of shed blood and broken, the broken body of Jesus reminds us that we're forgiven by the blood of Christ. And that, it, that as we take in that bread, it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And the life we live in this, in this flesh, in this sometimes corruption or all the time corruption of the flesh, we live by faith or trust in the one who loves us in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. So how much did he love us? How much did you love us, Lord? You loved us to the extent that you gave yourself up for us. So, Father, thank you that you have provided this table before us in the presence of our enemies. You have anointed our head with oil, that, that oil of joy, that even in the midst of this we can experience joy. It was also used for the healing of the sheep. So, Father, I thank you that you can bring healing to our bodies, that you can watch over our, our, our lives, Lord. Our cups overflow, Lord. You just don't give us a little bit or uh, just enough. You, you give us a super abundance that overflows in our life. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And for that, I give you praise. Uh, we are deeply and truly blessed. And Father, your goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. I love that, that still keeping with the shepherd's psalm, uh, that your sheepdogs of goodness and mercy come following us. And when we are straying from the path of righteousness, the righteousness that you would give, your sheepdogs of goodness and mercy come nipping at our heels, driving us back onto the path. Uh, and we have that promise from you, Lord, that you will follow, that the goodness and mercy, those sheepdogs of goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Till the last day I take breath, your goodness and mercy shall be with us. Till the last day, uh, those who are uh, listening, to the last days of their life, your goodness and mercy shall be nipping at our heels, following us, keeping us in line. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, Lord. I thank you for that promise of eternal life, that this is not just a temporal thing, but as so many scriptures in John and, and elsewhere speak of eternal life, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes um, the one who sent me, and see, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life, has eternal life. The moment we believe we have eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed, has already passed from death into life, from eternal death into eternal life. Father, I just give you praise for that, that we have that sure hope, not a, a wishful hope, but a sure hope because of the faithfulness of the one who promises. You never break a promise. You can't lie in giving a promise. You've even made it with an oath. And so, Father, we give you praise that we have that 
sure confidence that whatever happens ahead, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord. We will be with you, with Jesus, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit forever. Father, just I thank you for uh, that we can pray Psalm 23. And I just encourage uh, all of us that whenever we are troubled, we would uh, turn Psalm 23 into a prayer to you. Remember that you are remembering that you are the good shepherd, that you watch out over us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at um, Psalm uh, 3 today, and it's um, a Psalm of David again. And we see that it's when he fled from Absalom, his son. So we'll get into that afterwards in the reflections. But i just like to read it. And I'm, when I come to the Selah, you'll see the word Selah there. That isn't to be read. That means pause. So when I come to that, I'll just uh, give a pause, maybe bow my head, let you think about what uh, is there on the screen, are those words. We are to pause and pon ponder it, to think about it. So let's re begin. Psalm 3. O Lord, my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O God, O my God. For you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Your blessing be upon your people. So we begin again at the beginning. Psalm 3, it says, A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. This story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 13 through 18. If you get a chance, uh, sit down with your family or sit down with your spouse and uh, read through this whole story. It, it may be take about a half an hour. Uh, I woke up at, in the middle of the night last night at 3 a.m. and couldn't sleep, so I read the entire story. Um, it's a wonderful uh, account. It's a, a rated R account, if you will, because it has some rather grisly things in it, some uh, extreme wickedness in it. But uh, it's a story of Absalom and his father, David. And so I'll just give you a quick overview of it. Uh, Absalom has a very, very beautiful uh, sister named uh, Tamar. And Absalom also has a brother named Amnon, who has fallen in love with his half-sister. They have a different mother, but the same father, David. And so he has fallen lust lustfully in love with his sister, Tamar. And he has said that he is in deep love with her. And he's always pining for her in that lustful pining. And finally, one of his friends, Jonadab, who's a schemer and a twisted man, figures out a way to get uh, Amnon alone with his sister Tamar, his half-sister Tamar. And he says to Amnon, why don't you uh, pretend that you're sick and, and send to David that you would like Tamar to come to you and attend to you and cook some food and then attend to you and feed him because I'm you're you know you're really sick. So Amnon hatches the plan, contacts uh, King David, and King David consents consents and sends Tamar to him. Tamar bakes bread and fixes a, uh, some really nice meal, and then she's ready to serve it in the presence of the other uh, people in the household. And Amnon says, "No, I, I'm really sick." But basically, the implication. Come to me in my bedroom, and I, I will give you, and then you can attend to me. So she comes in, and, and the door is shut, and, and then he uh, essentially rapes her. Uh, afterwards, he finds himself vehemently hating her, and so he casts her out, uh, out of uh, his household, 
And now she uh, puts on sackcloth, uh, leaves with her hand on her head, which is a sign of great mourning. And David finds out about it. He's very angry. Uh, as a king, uh, he has the right and the, the duty to bring justice to this issue, and he does nothing about it, uh, to this horrible uh, event of the, the rape of one of his own uh, daughters. Uh, he just ignores it. Absalom, then, as a brother of the, of the one who was raped, is uh, very angry himself. And get this, he's so angry, he's able to wait for two years uh, to kind of let the commotion die down. And then he uh, tells King David, it's at the time of the sheep being sheared, and he's going to have a, a party watching the sheep shearers sh uh, shear the sheep. And so he says to David, you know, I'd like my brothers, uh, the king's sons, and even the king to come out with me to see the sheep shearers uh, shearing the sheep. And David says, well, I can't go. And, and you know, there's no, no reason to have uh, the other sons go. And, and Absalom specifically asks for Amnon and the other brothers to come. And so David consents. So he's instructed his servants to, when uh, uh, Amnon gets a little bit uh, tipsy with wine, when he gets merry with wine, that they are then at Absalom's command, his servants are to kill Amnon. And that's what happens. And so some of those who were present run quickly back to the king. And their first report is erroneous. They report that all of David's sons have been killed by Absalom. But then more people come in and, and correct the misinformation and say, no, it wasn't all of your sons. It was just Amnon who was killed. Now, David's very, very angry at Absalom, where he wouldn't do anything about Tamar. Uh, he's ready to do something with Absalom. So Absalom flees to a foreign country to a foreign city, and stays there for three years. All the while, David uh, is angry at his son for killing, his, for killing Amnon. Finally, Joab concocts a uh, way of getting uh, Absalom to come back. Uh, it's a long story, but he uh, acquires a woman of Tekoa who comes and pleads with the king and convinces him in a roundabout way to bring Absalom back. The king consents. Finally, Absalom comes back, but the king will not admit it admit him into his presence for two years. Finally, Dave, uh, Joab, um, David's general, convinces him that you need to welcome Absalom back into your presence. And so the king consent, consents, and Absalom falls on his faith, face before the king, and so on. So now you think everything is back to being hunky-dory. But Absalom, all this time of his father's um, neglect and his father uh, not having not having anything to do with him, Absalom heart has, Absalom's heart has grown very, very um, hard. And he's made a scheme now. So beginning with chapter 15, uh, he sits at the gate, and as people come from Israel to have David make a judgment on some dispute, he calls them aside and, and says, where are you from? And they say, well, we're of the tribes of Israel. And he says, you know, the, the king isn't really hearing anybody right now. He... he uh, isn't welcoming anybody, so you're kind of out of luck. But, you know, um, if I was made judge, I would hear you. And he resolves some of the situ he resolves the situations for the people. And by doing so, he turns over a two-year period, he turns all of Israel against David because they're thinking this is true. And he just kept doing this, sitting at the gate, uh, talking to the Israelites, coming in to have a judgment from David. So then he finally amasses an army against David, uh, at least well over 20,000 soldiers. And uh, David had, of course, spies around, uh, and one of those people came running back to David and warned him that Absalom was coming with a very large army, a mass from Israel, to kill David and to uh, take over the throne. Uh, and so David, along with three prominent families and the soldiers that had been so loyal to him through all of his battles, uh, flee Jerusalem. And it's a long story, but uh, they go over the brook, of, of, down into the Kidron Valley, go over the Kidron Brook, and then they ascend up Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, um, and then go over that. And they're getting ready to spend the night when one of his spies who's left in Jerusalem comes to him because one of uh, David's advisors has turned against him and has recommended to Absalom that he send 12,000 soldiers with this advisor to kill David. And so the, the spy warns David that this is happening. And one of David's spies uh, convinces Absalom that that's a bad idea. Rather, a mass um, 
all of the troops of Israel against David and pursue them uh, later, or at least uh, the following day. So David's able to spend the night. Uh, he doesn't know if uh, these troops are going to come or not. And um, it ends up uh, being that when Absalom comes with his troops, David's army routes uh, the troops of Israel. 20,000 Israelites die. And Absalom is riding along on his mule, and he comes up to a oak tree with very low-lying uh, limbs and gets his head stuck in the, the branches. And the mule just keeps going, and he's left hanging there in the branches. And one of uh, David's servants uh, sees Absalom hanging there, and he comes back and reports it to, to uh, Joab, David's general. And Joab says, why did you kill him? Why, you had the opportunity. Why didn't you put him to death right there? And uh, the, the servant says, well, I'm not going to put him to death. Look at what uh, David has done in, in the implication is he hasn't, he's always protected his sons no matter what they've done. So if I kill him, I, I'm, I'm a reproach then to David. So I'm not going to do it. So Joab takes three spears and goes, finds Absalom hanging from his tree, still there, and kills him with the three spears, plunge, plunges it through his heart. Uh, word comes back to David, and David uh, is caught in a deep mourning. I'll read that uh, section to you. Uh, he says, The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Uh, he seems to have more of a regard for his own sons, no matter what they've done. Then his daughter, it just seems so unjust. And so that's the story that's behind this psalm. And it's written somewhere in this journey when he's fleeing Absalom from uh, before Absalom's death. And so it says, let's work through this real quick. Oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up, up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. Oh Lord, how my adversaries in, have increased. Who are his adversaries? His own people, the Israelites. Many are rising up against me because... Uh, Absalom has turned their hearts against uh, David. Many are saying of my soul, there's no deliverance for him in God. Look at he's failed. He's failed to keep justice with um, with Tamar or, or yeah with Tamar. He's failed uh, to uh, welcome Absalom when Absalom actually did the just thing in killing his brother, at least from that uh, society, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? And so now they're saying there's no deliverance for him God, in God. And I think sometimes people that say that about our lives. There's no deliverance for us. Uh, even as Christians, uh, people, people will say, well, there is no God. There's no deliverance for you. And get this, sila, or to ponder this. Many of our saying, our, many of our saying of our lives, there is no deliverance for us from God. And it moves on, it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. We'll come back to that. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I have here what looks like Mount Sinai, but as I thought about it, it's not Mount Sinai. It's, it's Jerusalem. It was built on Mount Mor Moriah. So this is probably the holy mountain they're talking about. But I was crying to the Lord with my voice. What words for our day today? We cry out to the Lord. Stop this virus. Uh, bring an end to it, Lord. Uh, give us a victory in our own lives. Uh, keep us well. We cry out to, to the Lord. We can cry out to the Lord with one voice. And get this. And he answers us from his holy mountain. In our case, and he answers us from his throne of grace. Selah. We ponder this. It goes on and says, I lay down and slept. I woke for the Lord sustains me. So here he's gone up over the Mount of Olives. They're fleeing into the wilderness. Now they have to, it's dark. It's, they have to uh, spend the night sleeping. They don't know if they're going to be overcome by the armies of Israel against them. Yet he says, I lay down and I slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. Sometimes at night I wake up troubled. Sometimes I wake up to the thought, I have stage four cancer and I'm deeply troubled. And then I turn to the Lord. Notice what David does all through the psalm. He's constantly turning to Yahweh, to the Lord. And as we know, to Jesus. I lay down and slept. I woke, for the Lord sustains me. For the Lord sustains us. 
for the Lord sustains you. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. What words for us? Arise, O Lord, save us, O my God, O our God. Arise, O Lord, save us. For you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Deliverance belongs to Yahweh, the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. And I can't help of that verse in, uh, to think of that verse in Ephesians chapter 1 that says, We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We are deeply blessed people. And get this, your blessing be upon your people. To us, it's already on us. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Even through this journey we have, through this pandemic, his blessing is upon us as believers in Jesus. And then Selah, ponder this. So you don't need to just ponder this now, but go back through this psalm and read it and then ponder what's being said. Meditate on it is, is the idea. Uh, then I wanted to go back to those uh, words uh, earlier. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. This is the first time in the Psalms that David uses that image of, of a shield about him, that God is our shield, that the Yahweh is our shield, uh, Jesus is our shield. Uh, you think about this in pandemic. Sometimes I think it's entirely up to me and to our carefulness, which is important. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we are to be wise. We are to stay home. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. He's the one who protects our life. He's the one who protects your life. Uh, look to him. And uh, in him we find our protection and rest. And then he says, my glory. Uh, he's reminding himself of that the Lord is his glory. And uh, again, that glory of the Lord, the Lord God, the compassionate and gracious God, abounding in loving kindness and truth, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, and so on. That glory of a compassionate and gracious God who hangs in there with us in through the most difficult of times. He remembers God's glory. And the one who lifts my head. Uh, here, it could be that he's lifting his head as um, being restored to his kingship, or he could be lifting his head as one who is um, depressed and down, downcast. Uh, he's afraid. He's anxious. He's worried. He's worried about his own life. He's worried about the lives of his family that have uh, fled with him and all those with him. Uh, don't you get worried in the midst of this? Sometimes I worry about my daughter, Sarah, because she's uh, fighting on the front lines as a nurse, uh, sometimes taking temperatures of people coming into Mary Bridge to see if they're sick or not potentially getting exposed to the virus. Um, I get worried. Sometimes I get, get afraid. I, I get fearful. Um, but he's the one who lifts our head. Are you worried about finances? Are you worried about food? Are you worried about your job? Are you worried about uh, so many things, the health of your family, especially our elderly who live uh, with us or uh, amongst us? Get this. He's the one who lifts our head. And so I love, I love this. He's our shield. His glory overshadows us, that the Lord, the Lord, taken from Exodus 34, the Lord, which is that self-disclosure of, of God's uh, character and who he is. And he's the one who lifts our head. So I think we can take this as an affirmation. You can say it uh, out loud uh, to yourself and to each other. Uh, if you're in a family, you can uh, recite this uh, out loud. Oh, Lord. Uh, you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the one who lifts my head. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. Uh, that gets that idea cemented in your brain. That's, that's biblical meditation. That's being uh, taking that moment to ponder sila. Um, we got to turn our minds to those positive things, uh, not to the negative things. So 
Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, it's been encouraging uh, encouragement to, to me so that you can gather, take away two things from today. Uh, you can take away praying Psalm 23, and you can take away that affirmation. Uh, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the one who lifts my head. Thanks for joining me this afternoon or this evening for noontime prayer. I'm hoping to get back online tomorrow uh, and not have the problems that we ran in today. But um, let me close in just a quick word of prayer. But Father, I thank you for this time we have together. I thank you that you are ever watchful all over us. We look to you and to your strength. We look to you to be our shield. We look to you as the one who is compassionate and gracious, who is uh, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness towards us. Um, we look to you as a good shepherd. Uh, who will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thanks for coming, and I hope to see you tomorrow at noon uh, back live. Take care.